welcome everybody. This is this is terrific. It's really smashing turnout. It it gets better every time. This is like a Mooney's convention. This is really <laughs> Thank you, first of all, before I get round to you. Thank you to Claire and Michael and Michael. Thank you for supporting me, supporting you, and thank you all for coming and many of you coming again. We 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 had a, a do like this a few years ago before some odd interruption, plague, I think it was. And it went, went so well, and I got so caught up with the charity after that, it became our favourite charity in the gallery. So Farmers for City Children is the gallery's favourite charity. I'll tell you why later. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And you all are my favourite clients. Any factory to get your money. And also, Michael Foreman is the gallery's favourite and most successful illustrator. So, so it's an irresistible combination tonight. Um, they're, they're not the supporting act, I'm, I won't talk for very long, but I have to tell you about my enthusiasm for this, this charity. Farmers for City Children has become almost a sort of background driving force in our lives. We're thinking of new projects all the time, and I've got another great new project which are hatched today, and I will tell you about later, about a, a, an artist in residence, which the, Michael and Claire are, um, are absorbing this idea, and I think we'll, it'll be the basis of another show, and, and, and more fun. And I think Michael will carry on writing, and my, Michael Former will carry on doing these exquisite um, illustrations. Now, let me just talk about the illustrations, because something I do know her. Don't go on too much about the illustration. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to the writing, they're rubbish. <laughs> A very weak supporting act. I think they, they just get the right note. There's a soft, sensitive, delicate palette which just suits the narrative. And the narrative is picked out beautifully um, alongside the the very, very indifferent words from an obscure <laughs> author. <laughs> we, I told you about my love of this charity and what it meant, but I'm not going to go over what the charity is. There are so many of you here, we are preaching a little bit to the converted, but there's some new to it. And I exhort you to, to get hold of a, a really terrific leaflet, newly, newly minted, all paid for, and it's really good reading. It tells you, okay, you'll be inspired. And it's not just one Farmers for City Children that they've put together, it's now three. And hundreds of thousands of children have gone through this experience. And for many, it's changed their lives. And this is why I think it's a very, very important charity. I do support, and we all support, don't we? All the sort of sticking plaster charities, the charities that are really just a, a tourniquet on the misery of the world. The Syrians, the, the RSPCA, um, all, all, the, all the charities that, that engage us with terrible, if it's BBC doing it, viaristic views of, of terrible happenings every day. And of course we should be supporting those. But really, this middle-aged population, you're to blame. <laughs> I hold you all responsible. And the only way in which we can reverse this and turn away from the pity of war to stopping war is to concentrate on the next generation. Yes. The, yes. the young ones yes. are going yes. to be the savior of this world. Mm -hmm. You've yes. cocked it up. It's almost too late. <laughs> you, you're the disposable income people and you can support these, these great educational charities. This is a wonderful charity. I went, in theory, I, I love the charity, but this, this summer I went down to Devon and was entertained sweetly by the by the M's at Iddersley and I went round and I tell you it's another layer of inspirational um, information I got. They don't, these kids don't just go there for a jolly, though it is very, it's a beautiful farm and it is, it is a, a delightful, they would think of it as a holiday, but they're, they're involved. They're involved in the good husbandry of, of a farm that is really well run. Mm. And the kids who have probably never seen a cow or a pig <coughs> get to embrace nature in this way, in its natural setting, and they're made to work. They're made to, to measure the feed. They're made to um, coax the animals and, and look after them. 
and in the evenings there's, there's camaraderie. They, they knit together, no iPhones in sight. They sit around the campfire just like we, we, we used to think of it, it would be wonderful. But we, we, we've been too busy. We've been too busy fighting wars, making money, and now we need to concentrate on the next generation. Farms for City Children in its own way, and I hope it expands, is the way forward. Get children embracing the natural world in natural friendship, and you've solved a lot. Now, the progenitor of this great charity, um, half the progenitor, will now just say a word or two, and thank you, I'm sure, add to my thanks for you all coming along and buying the artwork, it's already six thousand pounds of your money has is gone to the charity from the from the artwork downstairs. So well done you. And we hope a lot more. Um, you can direct if you if you don't want to Michael's very very indifferent illustrations. Um, you can you can devote your money directly. That tells you how inside. So thank you from me, and now thank you to Michael. Um, do you want me to speak or will you do it? Like well, you're the, you're the worst man. <laughs> <laughs> what to say after that? First of all, an extraordinary thank you to this kind man for troubling uh, to do this. It, it's rare to find this kind of devotion and dedication. Um, and we really do love you for it. Thank you so much. And for those of you who have bought these in different drawings. Um, <laughs> thank you very much indeed for wasting your money. It's a terrible <laughs> mess. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the charity, but first of all, I want to invite onto the stage two people who are relevant to what I'm about to say. There's a person called Bill here. Do come up, please, Bill. Don't clap, you don't know you. Yeah. <laughs> Can you stand here and be good? <laughs> Liz, could you come up here, please? Yes, you. She's a head teacher. She, she's supposed to do what she's told really quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, they are relevant, these two, because they... Um, contributed in their own way, in different ways, to Farms for City Children. First of all, Liz here was chair for 10 years at least, 12 years of uh, the charity Farms for City Children, worked day in, day out for 12 years. She was a head teacher of um, London School, but I met her first when she was a head teacher in Rome. And her contribution to the charity over those years was phenomenal, quite wonderful. I'm so pleased she's here this evening. Could you give her a huge hug? <laughs> Not quite as important, <laughs> but just as significant in his own way is this gentleman here. How old were you when you came to the farm? Ooh, I don't know, just like seven. Seven. Which school did you come from? Uh, Lindhurst. Look how he grows. How he's on the farm. <laughs> it's wonderful to find an old farmer uh, who has memories in his head of the place and the people. Um, it's only a week of their young lives, but because they're so immersed in it, it stays with them. You haven't forgotten the smell, have you? <laughs> and, yeah. the, and the work? And the work, yes. And my favourite point was the uh, milking of the cows, which yeah. I hear is no longer happening anymore. Yes. But it's uh, that was my, my, my abiding memory, the iodine being painted on. <laughs> What's really wonderful, though, is because I, I go sometimes around reading um, books and things in festivals, is I meet from, and I'm really lucky, I meet the people who came. And very often they are this big. <laughs> and I think they're out for revenge. <laughs> because I'm the person who very often used to muck out sheds with them and go and um, 
Well, we went milking together, I guess, didn't mm. we? And then you're down a dark lane to the, to, to the dairy, and I bet you were frightened because you didn't do dark, did you, at that first? Well, those street lamps you have. You keep having lighting lights, in the yes. you know, think, think of what you've been wasting in terms of electricity on these things. We don't do lights at Nethercott. In a way, it's, I'm saying something a bit silly, but it's not. For a young person to experience darkness, for the really for the first time, dark, pitch black, and to, to wake up in the morning not to the sound of uh, engines or city, but to bird song, and then to go for for a walk, forget the farm just for the moment, just to go for a walk and scuffle leaves or break ice on puddles. That that's what they do, and that's why after years and years and years it stays in their head. And I think we all know from our growing time, it's the special moments that grow you, that make you the things you, the memories that you make when you're. Um, at school, out of school, with great teachers, sometimes with uh, great illustration, <laughs> <laughs> and quite good writing. It's all the same. It's the unforgettable. That's what makes and enriches lives. That's what we've been trying to do. But there's a third person. I should introduce. That would be boring. But I've got to introduce this person, otherwise I'll get, I'll get grief. Um, this is my wife, Claire. <laughs> um, Claire was the person who founded this charity. With it. I take the, um, how shall I say, the, the accolades. You know, I'm a sir now because of this charity. <laughs> but she's a lady too. And does she not look like one? <laughs> anyway, um, here's the thing. She had a great experience when she was little in that her daddy took her down to this village of Iddersley, where we now live, in the middle of nowhere in Devon. And um, she stayed at the pub. Can you believe it? Seven years old, and she stayed at the pub on her own with her friends and her daddy. And they didn't know what to do with her. So they would say to Claire, get your wellies on, go for a walk. This was 19... 40 something <laughs> and of course in those days there was no traffic there were no concerns and was only, uh, off she went and she wandered what ted hughes called the deep lanes of devon and she walked up farm tracks and went to meet the farmers groom the horses feed the calves just fell in love with that whole pastoral way of being she was a suburban child but experienced that young and then Later on, she got lucky. She married me. <laughs> she had been a teacher. I had been a teacher. We both realized that that kind of experience is so important, indeed, the right of every child to have, um, and which is why she set up the charity and I followed her because she uh, was going to make me live in the middle of nowhere, down a muddy lane in Devon. <laughs> what more could you want? <laughs> anyway, we ended up down there, and it's she who created these three things. So could you give her a huge hand? <laughs> you can sit down. You can back a minute. Sit down. <laughs> the book, the book, the book, and the lovely drawings, the wonderful drawings. Coffee field. Um, I just need to tell you a little bit about it. I know a lot of you have already bought a copy, so it isn't in the sale pitch because you can't go on buying the same book. But I just wanted to say why it was written, because it will interest you, I think. I came across the story of how John McRae, the Canadian doctor soldier, wrote the most famous poem of the First World War. And it's a beautiful story and a sad story. He was sitting on the steps of an, of an ambulance. Uh, he had just buried his best friend. And there was a, a grave yard, a place where they just buried people quickly, and one of them was his friend. And he sat on the steps of this ambulance, trying to write his poem. And this is true, and it was raining a bit. And he was deep into writing the poem. And Scribble, 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 and he kept chucking away bits of paper. And his sergeant came along and said, Sir, what are you throwing them away for? He said, Because they're no good. And this Canadian sergeant bent down and picked up the first copy of In Flanders Field. 
picked it up out, out of the mud. The rain was spat in it. He picked it up and he read it. He said, sir, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad at all. He said, no, it's not. I don't know. And he said, you can keep it if you like. And that manuscript went off to Canada in the pocket of that sergeant, probably, unless he was killed. And no one knows where it is. And I just thought that was an extraordinary story. Uh, and it was the inspiration, really, for this book, Poppy Field. That and the buglers who play, play their wonderful instruments uh, under the Menin Gate every evening at 8 o'clock in Ypres and have done since the 1920s and 30s. It goes on every single night. Uh, and it's about the Belgium of today, the people who live there today, and how they live alongside the, the wreck of their world, which is mending all the time, but nonetheless, under the ground, there are hidden dangers still. Four farmers every year get killed in Belgium and northern France by ploughing into buried shells. So the war goes on. I thought the best way to finish, in a way, is to read the poem. Actually, there's a Canadian here. Is he here? There was a rather nice Canadian man. <laughs> well, he wasn't nice if he was there. <laughs> you put your hand up and look Canadian, please. <laughs> Give him a hand, please, would you? <laughs> He's got a John McRae's countryman in Flanders fields. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though puppies grow in Flanders fields. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Uh, and I hope you'll all come back again. Yeah. 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 The season. Did you want to say something? <laughs> 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 I've started, so I'll finish. <laughs> the season isn't over. I'd like you all to come back. We open the illustrator's huge annual show on the 22nd. All very much welcome. There's a wonderful display of new Michael Foreman pictures. I hope you come and see that. And our Christmas party is on the 6th of December. We're having the jelly rollers along. It'll be a lot of fun. So please come to that as well. 22nd of November, 6th of December. Michael Foreman. I'd just like to say something because this book is very personal to me. Um, my granny had three sons. The eldest two died in the First World War. My dad was too young to join, but when he heard of his brothers being killed, he lied about his age and joined. Got to France just in time to be badly gassed. Came home and the story goes that he was never the same again. He died a month before I was born. Oh. Um, my granny had three sons, my mum had three sons, I have three sons, my wife Louise and I have two wonderful, beautiful granddaughters, <laughs> the youngest of whom is called Oh. 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 Oh.